welcome back for another six Caillou challenge called Killer Garage Door. This is quite interesting. So I won't read the whole thing. I'll let you go over that. But basically the scenario is, is that you're sort of simulating this garage door that has a problem. You know how we have modern garage doors have sensors to detect um, when there are obstructions to prevent people from getting injured, that sort of thing. So the idea is, is that you get a string passed in that contains events. Each character represents an event, and you'll see that code down here. If it's a period, that means nothing happened. P indicates that the button was pressed of your garage door opener. And O will indicate that an obstacle has been detected. And so they give you instructions on how you're supposed to handle these things and what the output should be. So here are the rules right here. If the door is closed, a push starts opening the door and vice versa. Pretty simple, basic remote, right? You just push it to open the door. It takes five seconds for the door to open or close completely. While the door is moving, one push pauses movement, another push resumes movement in the same direction. That's a little bit different, I think, than my opener. I think mine might go the other way when you hit it again. I can't remember, but you go with the rules here. So, um, let's see. Yeah, you're going to you're gonna get a string like this with the code. So you can see nothing happened, nothing happened. On the third second, a press was made. Then nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. Like that. And so they'll tell you in this scenario, um, hopefully you can see why the output would be this. When, when nothing happens, I suppose the last piece that I didn't mention was that the door has an, a position that would be indicated with the numbers zero through five. Zero would mean fully closed, five would be fully open. And you're told that you start with the garage closed. So that's why for these first two dots, you're at the zero position. So the output is actually reflecting the openness of the garage door at every second. And so once that push is made, you see it, you immediately go to position one. Obviously in real life, there's a smooth opening. It's, you don't jump in these steps like this, but please bear with the simple nature of this problem. And so they tell you to immediately snap once that press is made to, to you know, a little bit open, two would represent a little more open, three would be like 60% open, etc. And since no events happen, you notice how it, that number keeps going up, meaning the garage door is opening. But then when you hit that obstacle, you'll notice at that second, it went down from four to three. It immediately jumped down, just like uh, opening it, pressing the button immediately jumps to the next open value. And then it will keep descending down to zero. And since no other events happen, the door stays closed. So I hope that's clear. You should probably read through the instructions. They're not very long, just to make sure you understand it. I wasn't gonna uh, read the whole thing to you. I know you can do that. But I wanted to just make the important points. So what I'm going to do here is for this first solution, I'm just going to do the usual thing where I go through this and solve it just using the basic building blocks. I don't recommend solving problems this way. It's fine for code wars, but you're not going to solve real life problems of size this way. So if you stick around, I'm going to do an object oriented example that's like event driven programming we're going to use events to sort of handle this thing with actual objects but uh, to make sure you can do it both ways uh, let's do both so i'll start by just using pure basic logic you know kind of an ugly way of going through this but you can do it this way and I imagine most people who submitted solutions are going to end up doing it this way so we're not going to return empty anymore as usual, go ahead and pause if you want to have a go at this one. I'm going to set up a string for my output. And then you can imagine that each second I'm going to sort of concatenate onto the end of this. We're going to keep appending um, a value representing the openness of the garage door at each state. And you can imagine we obviously have to go through the input here. So I'll say char code in events. I'm going to call them codes. And so this will be the loop where we sort of process each event sequentially. It, remember, they represent one second at a time. So we're going to have something like if 
code equals, remember these are characters, what were our three values? It was P, O, and dot. So if you want, we can do them in order. No event, we're gonna handle that. Else if code equals P, we're gonna handle that in this scope. Else if code equals O, we're gonna handle that in this scope. And then it won't come up, but not a bad idea. If it's not one of the three defined codes, hey, Houston, we have a problem. Um, we'll say invalid code, just something that lets you know what went wrong. So good, this shouldn't come up and it won't. So yeah, maybe you needed just this initial step. You can take it from here if you want. Otherwise, let's keep going. And then by the end, you can imagine we're gonna return our output. So let's think about this. Um, and to solve this problem, I'm going to introduce, I wanted to point something out to you. Notice how with this class, normally we get static classes, right? And it's almost like a hint there. They didn't make it a static class. So you can uh, create objects out of this and we can have state. So I'm gonna make some state variables that are gonna help me understand this. So let's call one um, door position. That'll be a value from zero to five, right? I'm gonna initialize it to zero because we start in the closed position. I'll have a Boolean that says whether the door is opening or not. And since the door is closed to start, when that first button press happens, it's going to be opening to start. That's why I initialized it to true. But the idea is, is that um, if uh, true indicates opening, false indicates closing. And then, um, so this is just sort of saying the direction that's queued up to happen next when a movement happens. And then consider also we have a Boolean, a true or false, whether the door is actually moving or not. And I can use, by storing this state, I can solve the problem. So moving to start should be false because we know the door is closed. And so I can sort of manipulate this data to get an output. So if nothing happens, we, let's handle that case first. If nothing happens, well, um, we have to check here. If the door is closed, there's nothing to do, right? If the door is closed and, and no event happened, then do nothing. So the only case to handle here is when the door is moving. So consider that a press could have happened previously. So we need to be able to have, that would have set the door in motion. So I can say, if moving, sorry about that. That's my object um, part we'll get to later. And so let's, if it's moving, then we need to update the door position, right? And so we would do something like, in fact, let me make a little helper method to handle that. Cause it's, you can imagine it's going to be repeated. So I'll say, let's put it down here. Private uh, void update door position. And so it'll work with these variables to do the right thing. I can say, if um, opening, then that door position value should go up, right? Otherwise, the door is closing. We should decrement it. Okay, something like this. Now we can reuse this. So, if the door is moving, nothing happened, meaning no obstacles came up to impede our progress, let's keep moving, right? Update that door position. And then we gotta handle the case where um, the door gets beyond its limits. So for that, um, I could say, if door position equals five or door position equals zero. That means we've hit a limit, right, of the door. 
And so in these cases, let's stop it. Moving uh, equals false. So the, and then we should reverse the direction, right? Because once it hits the limit, if it went closed, then the next press should open. And if it was open, the next press should close. So the way you can toggle a Boolean is just reassigning to it the negation of its current state. So if it was true, it'll go to false. If it was false, it'll go to true. Okay, um, that looks good. In fact, this will be repeated too, so I'll probably factor that out into a, a little method too. But I think this covers us for the dot case. Remember, if we're not, if the door isn't moving and nothing happened, we don't have to handle it. So I essentially just ignore that case and nothing happens. Perfect. So now we have the part where uh, a press happened. That's what P means. So we'll do that case. Remember, uh, P will, if the door is moving, it'll pause it. If the door is stopped, it will initiate it. So in that sort of speak, then you can imagine moving will get toggled the same way. I'm just saying it in code. If it was moving, stop it. If it wasn't moving, start it. Okay. And then um, if the door was stopped and it was moving, we have to handle that case. If, it's, if, it, if it isn't initiated, meaning it's stopped, uh, we're good. So let's handle that moving case again. If moving, uh, again, we will update the door position and check the limits. So again, I'll, um, instead of copying this code, I should, here, let's, just, let's steal this right now. I was gonna refactor afterward, but we could do something like private void, let's call it, um, I don't know, check limits, or whatever you like. Put that logic in there. And you notice I don't have to pass any parameters in these methods because I'm using the state variables here. They're accessible to all these methods. So that looks good. Now I can, instead of repeating that everywhere, it can be as simple as check limits. Um, and even you see this code being re repeated so we could simplify that to check limits. Okay. So we handled um, a button press, right? We toggled its moving state. And then of course, if we made it move, remember they said immediately snap to the next open or closed position. So that's why I'm updating that door position as well. And then finally, we have the case where we hit an obstacle. So let's do that. If we hit an obstacle, um, we better be moving, right? That wouldn't make sense to hit an obstacle while the door was all the way opened or all the way closed. That would be like a malfunctioning sensor, right? So in real life, often I'll do something like, if it's some case that I really don't expect, I might do something like this. If not moving, throw a new exception, unexpected case. This won't come up, but it's a nice sanity check. Sometimes when I'm developing, I'll put something like this in there where I just, you never, you, you like, you're thinking this should never happen, you know, but it's nice to have these catches. Um, it makes debugging easier sometimes. And then maybe if you get confident that your program's doing the right thing, you can remove that check either way. But um, I'll put it in just as a, showing you a little, little life trick there that might help you out sometime. So what's the deal with when an obstacle it hits or is detected? Well, per the rules, basically, um, we should reverse the direction of the um, of the door, which way, it, whether it's opening or closing, right? So like how we the press uh, started it moving or stopped it. This is going to sort of reverse the direction. That's what the the detector is supposed to handle. So for that, we could say then, same concept, right? Just flip the 
flip the bit. Okay, and then we gotta again um, update our door position. Check the limit. I'll just steal one of these. Okay. Okay, so we've handled all three of those cases. We don't have any more. And then the idea being is that once you run through all the codes and process them, you can add to your output and add that door position, right? It's an integral value, but since output's a string, it knows under the hood to convert the numerical value to its string form. So that's done on your behalf. And you can imagine as you process all these codes, then you're gonna get door positions. Uh, the door could possibly be changing or not. And they're all gonna keep getting added for each second to output, and then at the end, return the output. So I think something like this should get us on the right track. We can go ahead and test it and see how many typing mistakes I did. Let's check it out. Okay, the typer namespace exception could not be found. That should be from the system namespace. You can look that up if you'd like. Using system. Remember the doc pages tell you which namespace things reside in. Okay, we hit the first simple test. We'll do the larger suite and green. Okay, so I got lucky and I typed everything right. Good. So yeah, let me go back to this. Now, this is fine. And again, if you wanted to um, refactor this, you see this part is repeated here. Or maybe you combine and put check limits as part of updating the door position, if that's your taste. You know, you can condense this code down some. Um, I'm not going to go crazy with that here because I don't even think this is the best way to go about the problem in terms of um, learning how to solve real problems. But we did make some nice improvements factoring this stuff out because you can imagine everywhere I had update door position, throw these four lines of code and space around it. Uh, same for check limits. You can see how that bloated stuff gets pretty quick. So not bad. You'd be fine submitting something like this. And I imagine a lot of people did but this is an educational course i want to teach you how to, i want you to be ready to solve real problems in real life and real problems aren't going to be like code war challenges that you can solve in an hour they're going to be very complex you're going to have lots of moving parts and this is about object-oriented programming so what do you say we get into it and make some projects or i'm sorry some objects and so i'm going to get rid of all this it's a fine solution. You can submit it that way if you like. But let's let's have some fun with some objects. Let's see how we might do this in real life. Now, what I accidentally flashed to, a little spoiler alert, I just made up this quick little diagram here to show you how to think about this. And this is sort of the power of object-oriented programming and why we do it. Um, you compose objects modeled after real world things or objects that are easy for us humans to think about. You know, we don't have to convert life into mathematical formulas. We can make the objects that we know and use in our everyday lives and understand very well, and make them interact with each other that way. But the idea being is when you're reading over the code, it's clear that, oh yeah, an owner has would have the remote and the have a sensor and a garage door on their house. You know what I mean? It kind of, even if you don't know a lot about code, a lot of people can understand it. So it's, it's user-friendly in that sense. And it's critical when you have huge projects, um, you wouldn't want to just write a bunch of logic everywhere for thousands and thousands of lines. I mean, you can, it's just, it can be hard to understand sometimes. So that's the idea here. Just real quick, know that each of these boxes represents a class that I'm going to make that we can create objects from. That's what classes do, right? And so the owner has these items, uh, the garage door, this shows the details of it. It has that door position that we used, right? And then I have these methods here. So the, the top half of the box there is kind of like the properties that the class has. 
and then the lower half shows the public methods. You know, there aren't any for owner. But over here, I can assign a remote. So think about that. When you buy a garage door, you get a remote. Not everybody's remote works with your garage door, right? That'd be terrible that anyone could get in your garage. So we're sort of assigning the owner's remote to their garage door. Similarly, you'll assign the sensor so it can talk to the garage door. And then all this tick thing is, is that it's just a way to update the garage door. I'm sort of mimicking like a game engine where you'll get that update every frame or every second. So it's just to tell it when a second has passed so we can grab the door state, that sort of thing. The remote and the obstacle sensor here, we're gonna get some exposure to events. So you can see what happens when, how to set those up and very simple it'll have a button you can press it press the button it f it fires off this event and obstacle sensor does something entirely similar so we'll talk about events and event handlers this syntax is a little weird but we'll get to it the thing itself is an event this second part event handler tells you the kind of method the method signature that other subscribers need to have if they want to handle this event, if they want to deal with it. So the idea with events is that the people who own, or I should say the objects that own the events are publishers, and then people can subscribe to them. And so whenever the remote raises this event, everyone who subscribed to it gets a notification. That's how these events work. And so you, it's almost like this won't be event-driven programming, but you can imagine you don't always have the input you need right away to solve a problem. You, the nature of your project may be you need to wait for user input. You don't know if they're gonna do that in five minutes or an hour. And so you can't really run anything until you have the information you need. And so there's this whole world of event-driven programming, and this might be a nice little um, introduction to it for you. And so, yeah, not much more to say about that. Um, this is just, these methods here are just for me to fire off the event. So let's implement this in code and kind of hook these things up in a way that hopefully is clear to you and beneficial. So good. We're gonna keep that output again. I suppose I didn't have to delete that. And then we're going to return the output at the end. And we're gonna go ahead and make our objects. Let's see, what would be the best place to start? Um, let's start with the remote. We'll make the remote first. And we'll do the obstacle sensor since they're pretty familiar. So I can say public class remote. And this is just your, your opener. I opted to call it a remote sense because it's weird. We call it openers, but they close too. So I was trying to make the more general word remote. Anyway, um, it's going to be really simple. It's going to look just like that class diagram I showed you earlier. Public event event handler. And I'll call it, like it said, button pressed event and then people can subscribe to this. And then I also promised to have that press button feature, public void press button. So our user can press the button to initiate things. And then to, to we wanna fire the event when the button's pressed, right? We want that to happen. So we can say button pressed event and you can call invoke. And I suppose we should talk about events and event handlers to make this make sense. But the signature of the event handler we'll look at is, let me type this out and we'll get there. So we're gonna invoke it like this. And while I'm here, I might show you, there's this newer syntax with the question mark where it'll check, it'll only hit invoke if this thing is not null. So it's like writing out if button pressed event is not equal to null. 
Because if you try if you try to invoke on a null event, bad things happen. You're gonna crash. You're gonna get a null reference exception. So if you want to write it out like this, that's fine. If you want to do it like the way I had it, that's good too. But yeah, if you ever see that question mark, that's all that is. And so let's talk about the event handler. This is a delegate. So it's just, I can't remember if we talked about delegates and challenges prior to this one, but I'll do a quick refresher. It just sort of sets up the signature of a method that you want to work with. So by signature, right, every method is unique in that it's sort of defined by its parameter list and what it returns. And so this is what event handlers look like. They have a reference to the object that initiated the event, and then they have these event args. We don't need the event args here, but they're really handy if you want to pass information along with your event. I don't, I, I don't think it would be hard for you to imagine how that would be useful sometimes to know. So say with our um, remote, maybe you wanted to send a timestamp information to know when the button was pressed. You know, if you were really had tight security around your house, you know, and what user that press was associated with, you know, anything. We don't need that here, but the event args are really nice for that reason. And so this is the form that all of our subscribers, they're going to have methods that automatically get called. So I'm going to raise the event in one class and then all the people that are subscribed to it, if I hook up a method to that event, it'll automatically get invoked on my behalf. That's sort of the gist of how this whole system works. So you can read through the examples here if you want this plus equal syntax is how you add events. We'll use that. Um, yeah, feel free to read through that all you want. We will leverage this to notice that this keyword I can send it, I can use for the sender. So I'll take advantage of that, um, like I did here. And I just send blank event args because I don't care. It needs, it needs a parameter. I don't care what they are, I'm not gonna use them. But it's as simple as that for the remote. And the sensor is going to be the same thing. It's just going to be a, in fact, I'll copy and paste this. We're going to do the same kind of thing. We'll call it obstacle sensor. Uh, let's call it obstacle detected event. Okay, and then what do we call our, um, we'll call it obstacle detected, where we sort of simulate the sensor getting that information. And so we got to use the right event, right? Same thing, only invoke it if it's not null. If there are no subscribers, then events don't get invoked, they don't get raised, so. Um, this invoke this and new event args. So really, I think I got those two down. Just super simple. They have events. People can subscribe to them so they know when the button's pressed. Good. Now we can handle our garage door and our owner, and we'll kind of have our system there. So let's go to the garage door. That's probably the most involved part of this, and the owner just sort of glues everything together. So we'll make a public class garage door and we mentioned that we are going to have some state variables it's going to be the same as that last one we're going to have a door position and a um the moving boolean and an opening boolean so i'm going to set those up public i'm going to make the position public so i can access it i'm using a property here that's what this syntax is so the way I want it set up is I'd use this get and private set. And since I had just get and not private there, anyone can access the value of this. But when I say private for the setter, that means only the class can change the value. I wouldn't want the remote to change um, or just any user to change what the garage door thinks the position is, right? The garage door should be the authority on this. The remote and the owner can can send the request, right? They're saying we want 
this action to happen, but it's the garage door's data, so it's in control. I hope that makes sense. So again, private bool moving and private bool opening. And for those, I suppose I should initialize those like I did too. Moving would be false to start and opening would be true to start. It's gonna start in the closed state and should open to start. So I made these private because it's really, it's only the garage door that cares about these variables. So if you don't need something to be public, make it private. You complicate the class when you make everything public. You just have all this data and people that want to use your classes don't need to know all that. You don't, don't give them more information than they need. So enough said there. Let's go to those, let's see, we could do the update. No, let's do the, we, we've got to assign the remotes, right? This should be able to take on remotes. So that would definitely be public. Public, we'll, it'll, it can be void and we'll say assign remote. We're gonna pass in the remote. And for that, um, we don't actually need to save the remote for this example, but a lot of times you will have a reference, meaning I could set up a private remote variable and sort of cache that and save a reference to that. For this example, I don't need it, so I'll ignore that. All I need to really do is subscribe to the event. So I can say remote, and remember remote had that button pressed event. So I'm saying I want to subscribe to that and I need to put what method of mine I want called whenever that event fires. And so I will call it um, remote pressed handler. Notice I'm not invoking the method. So this is going to be a method that I make. You assign methods and they have to match. Remember for the events here, the delegate here, the type of the method that you assign to be notified by the event is specified here. So it's got to be this event handler type, which we talked about it has the signature this. So we, we need to make our signature like that. So let's make that method in our garage door. That can be private. No one else needs to know about that. So private void um, remote pressed handler. And we're gonna need that signature there. Okay, oops, got double parentheses for my copy there. Okay. So good, we got a sender and event args. And then we gotta say what we want to happen here. So if for fun, I'm gonna add some statements so you can see this thing kind of in action. And we'll say button press. And then when you think about the instructions of the challenge, what did it mean to press that? Well, it means to toggle the moving state, right? If it's moving, stop it. If it's not moving, start it. So like we did in the other challenge, it's simply change the moving state and I'll write this out so you can know that that's happening. Okay. And then similarly, we need to be able to assign a sensor to sort of hook our system all up so it's all talking to each other, right? When you buy the garage opener, this is already done on your behalf. Somebody's already set up the remote to, you know, to communicate with just your garage door and the sensors are wired to it and there would be logic you know, coming by way of wiring and uh, computer chips in the garage door opener. And we're sort of modeling that. So we can say public void assign sensor. And it's gonna take an obstacle sensor, just call it sensor. Again, I'm not gonna store a reference to the sensor, but that might be common in real life. So if you needed to re repeatedly access the sensor, like maybe you needed um, something to disable it, you know what I mean? And 
maybe at some point in time, you might want to store a reference to it and it would have a, a method disable where you could sort of turn it off. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just letting you know. We don't need it here. That's why I'm not doing it. So just like we did with the remote, we'll say obstacle detected event. We're going to plus equals and we need to make a method that again matches the event handler signature, which is this, right? Returning void, taking this as parameters. So let's make a method for that and handle it. Private void, um, let's call it what? Obstacle detected handler? Obstacle detected handler. And we need the same signature because if you don't match that signature, it's going to say, hey, not, it's not the right type. This is not the information that the event is putting out. You don't match. You don't qualify to subscribe to this event. That's sort of what happens. And you'll get errors. So um, again, let's put a statement so you can see this thing kind of fire off. And we'll say danger. And then what should, do you remember what we did for the obstacle detected? It was, we had to toggle the opening state, right? Same, same thing as we did with our other implementation, toggle that opening state. So good, we can assign rem our remotes and sensors, get those hooked up. Once we assign those, they'll be hooked up. They get subscribed to their events and they'll fire off whenever those objects publish their events or raise their events, I should say. Publish, raise, however you want to call it. And so let's see what else we have to do for our garage door. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do that tick thing. So we mimic it, getting that information every second. And so for that, I'll say public void tick. You could also call it update. You know, I work with Unity a lot and there's an update method that you get that gets called every frame. It's much faster than a second, but um, it's the same idea there. You can update your state in there. Uh, so tick, let's do it just like our other implementation. Remember we had to update the door position. So we'll make that method here too. We'll call it, yeah, update door position works. And again, that can be private. No one else needs to know about that. Private void update door position. And for that, um, it's going to be just like we did before. In fact, I'll just copy and paste it to spare you the trouble. And I'm going to combine the limit checking in here too. Notice that I have some don't it, this is just what we did before okay no magic happened here i just put the extra check limits behavior in here too and you'll notice i replaced the quote unquote magic variable values with constants and so we can define these constants and you notice it reads a little bit better so while we're doing best practices why not public uh static read only int Oops, got to name it. Max open would be five, right? And fully closed will be zero. So not a big deal in here, but you can see it. It reads much nicer. If the position is max open or fully closed, stop moving it and reverse the direction. So good. And you could have combined these in the last challenge too, like I said, or I'm sorry, the last implementation. So we've got our update door position that's going to get called every second, right? Because I called it from our tick method. Um, let's see, I think that does it for the garage door. We can move on to our owner class. Let's do that. The owner isn't strictly necessary, but it's kind of uh, the glue here. And again, I'm just trying to model how you might go about solving a real problem. Some of this stuff isn't entirely necessary, but I'm going for a best practice award here. 
So we'll say public class owner. This is just the human that owns the garage. And so it has those properties, right? Um, I said we didn't have to cache those. Maybe I'll show what that could look like here. But the idea will be that we'll make a constructor, public owner, and it should take the various parts. So I, it can take a remote, a garage door, and a obstacle sensor, right? This is kind of like you buying the kit, the garage door opener kit with all the parts. And so we could have private, remote, remote, private, garage door, door, private sense, oops, obstacle sensor, sensor. And so you could assign all these values here, remote equals remote, then you have a reference to them. I'll show you, you don't need it at the end. Door sensor equals sensor. But the idea is, is that in this constructor, this will call get called, right, as soon as we inst instantiate an owner object, this gets called automatically. That's how constructors work. But we sort of need to um, glue these things together. And so for that, let's, the, the work that needs to be done is assigning those remotes and those sensors, right? So we can say, oh, while I'm up here, I notice I totally forgot to put the obstacle detected handler. And look at it, I almost left this too. I told you, don't do this. That invokes the method. You don't wanna call the method. You wanna give a reference to the method itself. If you call a method, you get what it returns, void. So we're assigning the method name to the event. We're that's what we're registering, not, not void. Glad I, I noticed that. <laughs> so um, back in our owner, let's go ahead and assign. So to do that, those go with the garage door. We could say, door assign remote remote door assign sensor sensor so now everything should be hooked up and they should be able to communicate with each other those are the four parts of our system um yeah i'll, I'll rerun that and show you you don't need to save references to these things. But I kind of wanted to show you too about how when you make classes, they're sort of a composition of smaller objects or other objects. You sort of compose objects from objects and you build larger systems that way. But I think I got enough here. So now it's a question of actually implementing this method, right? And it should be relatively easy. Now we have all of our parts here. So um, we can, we have to make the objects and then sort of run the logic. So I can say re remote, remote equals new remote, garage door, door equals new garage door, um, obstacle sensor, sensor, equals new obstacle sensor. And then we have an owner as well that should have, that is sort of constructed out of these. Remember owner had a constructor that took all three. I think the order was remote door sensor. Okay, so we've got our objects in place. They're hooked up, right? When I made the owner, it's constructor fired off and hooked these things up the way we needed to because we handled that. So now it's a, it's down to processing the input. So again, for each char code in events, and we get to handle this. It'd be a little bit easier this time. So we can say, uh, if code equals P, we're looking for a P, then 
That indicates a remote press. Remember, remote had a method press button that will fire off its event. And since the garage door is subscribed to it, it'll get that notification and automatically call its handler method. See how nicely that works when you get it set up? And then code equals an O would be an object, or I'm sorry, an obstacle was detected. So we'll want to fire off sensors, obstacle detected. Uh, it, when we call that method that we set up, remember in the body of that, it fired off the that associated event. Then the door gets, since the door subscribed to that event too, it gets a notification and it calls its event handler method in its own class that handles it. And then remember I made the tick method. So the door calls its update door position every second. Remember each one of these code represents a second. So I'm calling door tick just so it updates its state. It'll move it in the proper direction if it needs to. And then finally, we got to update our output, right? And the door had that position property. Oops, it's a property that we can update with. And then finally, we can return the output. Um, and we didn't have to do anything if there was no event. So um, surely I type something wrong. <laughs> I caught a couple of them. So um, be gentle here. Okay, line 105, let's check it out. Identify expected. What do we have here? Remote equals remote, door equals door. Oh, sure, look at this. I put the type, variable name, type, variable name, type, and I didn't give a name to it, so. That is nonsensical. Compiler, your complaint is fair. Uh, let's see, line 99, only assign the call, increment and decrement can be used as a statement. Let's go back to 99. What did I do here? Line 99. Oh, look at that. Oh man, what was I thinking? I was trying to, you know, toggle opening, not <laughs> exclamation mark equals. I don't know what the heck I was doing there. That's some other programming language or something. Okay, nonsense. Nonsense, sorry if you were yelling at me the whole time. Hey, that's not bad. I only messed up those two and the two I caught. Okay, so, well, can't claim victory yet. Okay, now I can claim victory. So let me expand some of these so you can see. Um, you can see the bu we had one button press and one obstacle event. Let's see if we had any others. That one just had a button press. And so if you wanted to see the um, input that was associated with this. Come on, take me to the, t oh no, what'd I do? I'm just trying to scroll to the top. Okay, I think I got control back. Anyways, you could have, if you wanna see the input that it's associated with, console, right line, Just print that out. Um, we can run again. And since we got all green, I would expect it to line up, but just expand one of these, go to the log. Um, no events, okay. It was empty, but can you give us something with some? So events, there was just a P and we had a button press. You had a button press and then a bunch of nothing, and you see the one button press re registered, right? Isn't that cool? You can see how the events were fired off. Um, should I have some obstacles in here for us? Here we go, obstacle. So you had two presses and an obstacle event, you see those logged out. So yeah, um, you know to add the console right line statements to help you understand how this goes. I'm gonna go through and remove these print statements that I don't need. Clean this up a bit before I submit. Um, I'm good with all of that. That looks good. That looks good. Door position. I wanna get rid of these comments. 
yeah, hopefully you appreciated making these into objects. And even though it's, you know, seems like more code, it's kind of easy to think about, right? It's easy to think about an owner. In fact, let me show you that you don't need these. Like I said, we don't need to store references. I just didn't want this class to look entirely useless like it is in this contrived example, but, um, so you don't need to save those. When I get out of here, we should still be green. Make sure. Okay, so we're good. We're still clear for submission. So yeah, I wanted to make this look more like a legitimate object. Um, I'm doing the best I can to demonstrate for you with a, a simple example. So yeah, hopefully you appreciated that. Learn something. Maybe events are new. They're a little tricky to wrap your head around at first, but you'll get it. Uh, you know where to find me if you have questions or comments. Let me submit mine off. I'm going to be the weirdo that made a bunch of objects that I didn't necessarily need. And so, yeah, we got lots of people doing things. Feel free to go through these. You see what I mean, though? All this if, else, and switch and stuff. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's all right. I'd rather work with objects, make nice objects, nice small objects, compose larger objects from all these finely detailed objects. Can you imagine trying to do this, though, with, with some really large problem? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I'll look through these. You can look through these two on your own time. Like I said, you know where to find me. I appreciate the likes and subs. I'm almost up to 600 subscribers now. I just need one more, I think. So that's exciting. Anyways, I'll see you in another challenge. Thanks for watching.